coming up on this edition of Rook. Teacher saying to me, oh, can I just call you Beth or Sarah or something that sounds like Beth, not Sarah, or... And I said, no. <laughs> it was like 8.30 and the, the band started playing and everybody was up and dancing and throwing things around. And, you know. I have a new Persian caviar guy. He delivers caviar what? from, so, so from the... Just so, so stop right there. <laughs> if England were to meet Iran, what do I do? Oh. You dumped Michelle for LL Cool J? Yes, I did. I, I was like, very nice to meet you. Good luck to your husband. <laughs> Bye. It's November 22nd, 2021. This is Rook. She was born in Iran before the revolution and came west with her family adjusting to life as a teenager in the rugged city of Philadelphia in the 1980s. But Behnaz Sarafpour had an interest in fashion and ended up graduating from the prestigious Parsons School in New York and launching her own line in 2001. Since then, her designs have been on the cover of every major fashion magazine and have been handpicked by the likes of Angelina Jolie. She received the National Design Award at the White House in 2013 and now she's got a new line of fragrances inspired by Persian scents. Behnaz Sadafpour joins me for a feature interview from New York. Plus, the Rook team is here. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 156 of Rook. Nice to be talking to you. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Hi, Groovy Shaya. Salam, hi. Salam. Hi, Aziza. Hi, Aziza. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, the numbers go up slower now. It's 156 of Rook uh, because right, we have right. the Contemporary History of Iran, our yeah. series on Thursdays, which is one, two, three, four. There's seven of those so far now. We're, we only count one new Rook episode a week oh, officially. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, and hello, uh, the fabulous Kian. Hi, Gian. You always have your um, ball cap on for I this do. is your game face. You know, I uh, don't need to impress you guys. I, don't I notice when you <laughs> when you record uh, Unmarried Persian Girls, that new program you're doing. You yes. you don't wear the you, you're all dolled up. You look I'm all great. Because I'm seen you know? by people that matter. Uh-huh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Right, thanks. No, <laughs> you know, I feel like one of the boys when I'm with you guys. I throw on a baseball cap. It's yeah. All right. a, a cool you kick dude. me at the door before coming in. <laughs> uh, what'd you say? Can, what language is he speaking? I have no idea. I'm <laughs> never tra- understand pretending like I yeah. understand, <laughs> but really I don't. Behnaz Sadov poor. You okay, Shia? Yeah, everybody's <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, we, got a, we actually have a very successful person coming on the show today. Uh, a person who's been given an award by Michelle Obama. No way. Yeah, that clearly... Not any okay, of these I'm, people. Okay, I'm walking out. <laughs> I don't deserve to be here, <laughs> sharing space with Behnaz her. No, Sarafpour. I mean, her brand has been everywhere. I love this story. I love the, the Persian girl comes, um, lives in Philadelphia. I mean, Philly is not necessarily, I'm going to bring this up with her, but mm. not necessarily known as the fashion capital, especially <laughs> back in the 80s and 90s when she was a kid growing up, you know. Uh, and then and then launches her own brand, has been tremendously successful. And, you know, for a long time, was not doing, you know how we've had designers on who actually um, are inspired by their Persian heritage and do Iranian type stuff. Um, as I understand it, she was not interested in that. She wanted to sort of, she's in that category of, I don't want to be pigeonholed as just the Iranian mm. designer. I'm a world-class designer. Mm-hmm. But then recently has done these fragrances, uh, which uh, are Behnaz fragrances, which are based on um, the smells of what she grew up with in Iran. Wow, I love yeah, that. her perfume line. 
Uh, one is called The Scent of Shia. It's a uh, no, it is beautiful not. patchouli kind of. Uh, <laughs> it smells like a stoner. <laughs> so you Must put that on and uh, people think you've been... Uh, <laughs> Philosophers. <laughs> we are coming to you from... Uh, well, coming to you on rokamedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on our ongoing mission, folks, to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity in English. Persian media doesn't have to only be in Persian. Mm -hmm. Let's be accessible to the whole world. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, you can switch over to YouTube uh, if you're not there already. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram, where most of the material there is bilingual. Uh, partly the work of Savvy Roham. Yeah, that's right. And his Sibyl. <laughs> hey, if you want to support us, you can be a patron of this show. Go to the Support Us button on our main website, rookmedia.com. And for five or 10 bucks a month, you can be a, a supporter of Rook. If you're a regular listener, we really appreciate you uh, being part of our crowdsourcing to help keep things going. Uh, rookmedia.com is where you can find the Support Us button. You know, last week... Um, our Ardashir Zahedi, mm -hmm. uh, he, I guess it was about four days ago, he, he died. Uh, the foreign, a former foreign minister mm -hmm. of Iran, I guess from around the uh, late 60s, 1966 to 71, I think he was a foreign minister. Then, of course, the ambassador to the States in the 1970s when we had uh, Firuz Zahedi yeah. here. Mm -hmm. He was telling us those stories of the parties and the mm -hmm. ambassador's residence and the, the I guess, flirtation or relationship or that uh, Ardashir Zahedi had with Elizabeth it's Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously a major figure in um, modern Iranian history yeah. from back to the coup of uh, 53 uh, to beyond that, uh, his lineage, his marriage, uh, yes. all of that. Um, so we're going to do something in the upcoming episodes uh, uh, of Rook or the contemporary history of Iran, excuse me, <coughs> about Ar Ardashir Zahedi. Mm -hmm. But on the same day, uh, my uncle, my dear uncle Hu Shang, or Hu Shi as he was known in the, in the uh, family, died as well in Tehran. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Uncle Hu Shang because um, he, was, he was quite something. He was, uh, uh, he's the guy in the family, you know, the uncle who you would go to who would have a perspective on, uh, on everything. He knew, he knew, you know, especially when it came to history and politics, you know, he, he had the answer. If you were like, uh, when was the Cuban Revolution? You know, he would be able to tell you, you know. Uh, and so those were his passions, but he was actually a painter. Oh. Uh, yeah, he was a great painter. And, and uh, uh, he, never professionally, or I don't think, I don't know if he sold his paintings, uh, but I know that he was quite prolific in his paintings. And we have this painting in my, uh, my mom's house in Thornhill that he did. It's one of my favorite paintings uh, of any kind, anywhere. It's a depiction of life in Ahvaz. You know, my dad's family yes. was from Khuzestan. My dad was born in Abadan. They grew up in Ahvaz before they transplanted to Tehran. And so this would have to be, uh, I guess, maybe the 1930s. He's imagining uh, the family because Hu Shang was younger than my dad. And my dad in the painting is about three or four years old on a little tricycle. Oh. Uh, and my grandmother is there and a few other members of the, of the oh. family. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to have that piece of art from uh, Uncle Hu Shang, uh, my late uh, dear uncle. Uh, so these are the ways that I remember him. My dad would always talk about him. You know, he was he and my dad were very close, and uh, through the years they would always be on the phone. You know, I met him a few times as a little kid before the revolution in the 1970s, uh, twice in Iran. I was there on my second birthday, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, I posted on the social media this uh, this weekend that you know there's a picture of me on my second birthday with mm -hmm. Uncle Hussein holding me, uh -huh. uh, and uh, he was this fashionable guy, you know, holding me. and and that was in Tehran where we celebrated my second birthday, and then again, again right before the revolution when I was five, we went back to. Uh, Iran, uh, and I remember him seeing him then. He also came to the UK uh, once or twice, so I remember him as a little kid when he came and visited us in in London. 
really cool guy. You know, he always wore shades. He was the kind of guy that uh, Reza tries to be. <laughs> uh, you know, yes. not Reza wears uh, the shades the and wants to look like a cool guy. Wants to look like Malcolm X. You know, <laughs> Uncle Hushang was actually that way. You know, uh, he was like this cool guy. Always had, as I say, always had these amazing perspectives. Now, I, what I wanted to say is, I, I feel it is reductive oftentimes to make everything about how our uh, collective lives have been affected or displaced by the revolution uh, and this uh, Islamic regime. But here's the reality, right? Post-1979, 1980s, no chance my family could go to Iran. I mean, mm-hmm. there's craziness, the Iran-Iraq war, et cetera. Yeah. So I don't get to see Uncle Hujang then. Then for the 1990s, uh, I'm in that age group, you know, I was in my 20s, where I would have to go and do Sarbazi. So uh, I really wanted to go to Iran, but there was a very good chance that if I went, okay, you're going to have to go right into the army and be a soldier because, of course, my lineage is Iranian. My dad was Iranian, et cetera. Uh, and then the last two decades, you know, I, I was outspoken about things in Iran or whatever, the political issues, uh, people I've interviewed, et cetera. So it's always been people in my ear going, I don't think it's a good idea for you to visit Iran. So so here it's 42 years now that it wasn't really a possibility for me to see Uncle Hushang. And it really uh, breaks my heart because for people like me and Keon and those of us who've grown up in the diaspora, you know, People talk about not being able to spend time with a loved one during the pandemic. You know how one of the narratives of the pandemic was, you know, someone in their final days, you couldn't spend time with them in the hospital, you couldn't attend the funeral. Well, it's like we've had our own version of COVID Mm -hmm. for four decades now, where, you know, it's not really an option for me to, other than from afar, through phone calls and writing letters and you know and for most of that time by the way the phone calls were crackly they were difficult and it was only recently that there's zoom and these kind of things for me to really be able to spend time with with an uncle like this it was just not really a reality not really a possibility so it's heartbreaking when we lose somebody like this because that window is closed Mm -hmm. for me to have ever gotten time with uncle hushang and you guys know how much i love to travel i've been all over the world you know it's not like i'm a a guy who likes to sit home all the time of course i would have gone to iran a hundred times by now right i i mean i would have and uh, so it's very difficult. It's very difficult to reflect on that. And I know that there are folks out there who can relate to this, mm-hmm. you know, who have either left Iran and, and have family there or who never grew up there and have family there. And it's, and it's this divide that we, you know, it's, it's our version of the, the Berlin Wall, you know. Yeah. You're, you're just not going to see the, the person on the other side. I know, I know there's folks who, that go back and do see their families and travel, but, you know, for based on my generation and based on the things I've done in my life, that's just not possible for me as it, as it is not possible for a lot of other folks uh, who are, you know, on this side of the fence. And uh, uh, so uh, it's with sadness that I yeah. didn't get to spend more time with Uncle Hushang mm-hmm. in, in recent years. But um, here's a shout out to Uncle Hushang from, uh, from Toronto, Canada. Your memory will be rich for our family uh, and, um, and those who knew you. And uh, uh, I've. Um, it's been an honor to get to spend a few minutes just talking about him to keep his name alive out there in the world. Rest in peace, Uncle Hushang. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess you can relate to what I'm talking about, huh? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think a lot of our guests as well. It, you know, it's uh, you hear of this Iran, you hear the landscapes, you hear of all these beautiful stories and. I, like you, I don't think I can ever go back, at least with this government in place. And uh, it's it's hard. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. And the more the years go by, the more I feel like, I don't know, I'm losing touch with mm-hmm. the, the country. You know, mm-hmm. I'm losing touch with the culture. And I would love to go back. But Yeah, losing touch with this is family that you don't yeah. get to. I mean, a family divided by, I say, like I say, a virtual 
Berlin yeah. Wall, a fence that says, no, you you know, you guys are not going to get to see each other. And it's not always political, Gianni. I mean, you mentioned that for the majority of your life, you're, you're facing, like, if you had to go to Iran, you had to serve the Correct. army. Correct. And, yeah. In or, yeah, and simply because your lineage is the Iranian, you can't, you can't, but you're a Canadian citizen, you can't go to Iran and visit Iran with a Canadian passport. That's correct. And that's something that I think uh, maybe folks who are non-Iranian yeah. who are listening they don't, really don't might, might not understand. Yeah. I can't travel to Iran on a Canadian passport. No, you can't. Despite the fact that I'm a Canadian citizen, mm-hmm. Despite the fact that I was born in England, I'm a British yeah, Canadian citizen, yeah. but in the eyes of Iran, That's right. I'm seen as an Iranian. As an Iranian. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, which in and of itself, uh, great. You know, I'm happy to be, but it, that means I get treated. Yeah. That means that, you know, I guess it was under the age of 35. If I were to go there, they would say, well, you're Iranian. You haven't done your army time That's yet. Right. Let's go, yeah. right? Yeah. And that, that did, so that would have to be a choice for me yeah. to pick up from Canada and go and spend two years in the army in Iran to be able to visit my relatives there. I, you know, obviously yeah. that's not going to be a necessarily the, yeah. the reality like yeah. I, was, I remember i was sharing the same test similar testament with a friend of mine who was lebanese and he said that oh i just go to lebanon with my canadian passport and i was like oh well we can't do that we can't show our canadian passport there so there is a there is some technical like tech there's some difficulties that are not necessarily political but just i don't know technical and uh, that restrict people from visiting their yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's ambiguity. I mean, you don't know. I don't know that if I go to Iran, it's going to be some big right. problem. But you know, people sort of say, "Ah, it's probably not a good thing for you to go," and it's not a good time. What, whatever it is, mm-hmm. uh, it, you guys know my passion for how badly yeah. I'd want to go to to Iran. I mean, I'm going to you know. Istanbul because I uh, I love the city but because it, it, it's as close as I can get you know yeah. I want to go to Dubai and that means I'm close to Iran that kind of thing yeah. um, and um, it's very hard it's very hard to even now for his funeral for me to, to, to it's it's like not an option you know yeah. we just give that up we give that seeing family is, is not an option the planes exist the ability to get there exists you know that the, the technology exists but it's so bizarre and unique to us to Iranians yeah. like I haven't seen any other culture whose, whose face is the I, same I had the same situation with my grandma actually a few years ago where you know she always wanted to be buried there and she lived there and she was too old to travel here so that you know i i have memories of her when i was young but i'm just sad that i didn't get to spend more time with yeah, her so yeah yeah it's Ho- hard hopefully we'll get to do an edition of rook in tehran one that day. Would that, wouldn't amazing. that be great that would be awesome. wouldn't yeah. that be great yeah, yeah. Oh. it has another side actually like for for me that i'm growing up in iran you know like i i was listening to dariush to ebi to all those to you know the all those great singers and I was sad that so I want to see them live in mm. a concert yeah. and so yeah. you feel disconnected when you are inside Iran and yeah it's very sad you, you know. know on the face of it it's just so ridiculous it, the whole thing is is ridiculous you know but uh, <laughs> you know what are you going to say uh, rest in peace beautiful dear Uncle Husheng hey I should mention for this episode a big shout out to Farid Ameryoun and York National Realty for helping to bring this episode of Rook to your ears and eyes. York National Realty is a boutique real estate company based in Aurora, Ontario, Canada that provides top tier service with its team of Farid Sean and Nahal. They're a full service realty firm that is there for everyone from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid and the team have also made it their mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora and have supported a number of Persian community events and projects. If you're looking for real estate, this boutique firm is where you should go, especially if you're in the Aurora New Market area. Thank you to Farid, Sean, Nahal, York National Realty. Go yorknational.com, yorknational.com. All right. How was your weekend, Keon? It was good. I uh, I have a new Persian caviar guy. He <laughs> delivers caviar what? from, so, from that's, the... Just so, so stop right there. It's, it's, it's the most Keon <laughs> thing Keon has ever said. Who doesn't Jesus want caviar Christ. from You mean the, you have a person who yeah. brings you your caviar? <laughs> he sources it from the Caspian uh-huh. Sea. I mean, where can you she get... She lives in another you, universe. The, like the, I mean, Shia and I are like... <laughs> we go to the, you know, mini Chinatown to see if we can get noodles cheaper than <laughs> at the Loblaws. No, but really. Uh, it's, it's, speaking of How home, many caviar people do you have? I just, you got a new one. Just the one guy. Oh, yeah. 
okay. I just discovered him, and he's great. He, he sources it straight out of the uh, Caspian Sea. Oh, do you, you have to, to meet him somewhere, like in a parking lot? <laughs> and he <laughs> delivers. It's uh, great. Uh, and I swear to you, every time I eat a little bit of that caviar, I just imagine home. Brings you back to it takes uh, me back all to the Iran. other caviar you've eaten. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of home, I mean, isn't that something special? We have the best yeah. caviar in the world, Only guys. leave it to Keon to make the most <laughs> relatable concept, make it unrelatable. There are Virgin people listening caviar. right now that know what I'm talking about. Yeah, like home. five people, maybe. <laughs> entire universe. Wait, have you, okay, question. Have you guys had If you are one of those people, please give us money for a real... <laughs> Because Keon <laughs> is spending it on caviar, uh, and we doesn't give us. It. Can yeah. I ask you guys? Have you guys tried caviar from the Caspian Sea? Not from no. Caspian Sea, but I've tried like salty caviar. Okay. Or well, if you if you have to compare, you have to mm-hmm. try the other, you know, the nonsense caviar that's from the Russian <laughs> borders, <laughs> and then compare it to the Caspian Sea caviar. My God, it's like you know. I'll tell you something, Reza. Huh. I had this caviar guy. <laughs> he would come to my house, and I said, "This is not good enough." <laughs> and I got a new caviar. Was it guy. a Caspian Sea caviar? Yeah. Guy? I mean, you know, I, the guy would just give the guy my credit card, <laughs> say, "Get me the Caspian Sea," and then he would come, and it wouldn't be good enough. So now I got myself a new caviar guy. <laughs> nice. You know, some people nice. and, uh, some people have it. drug dealers. I have a caviar guy. Okay. <laughs> what life do you have? What is this life you have? <laughs> you live once, man. Shia, enjoy I enjoy mean, a good uh, caviar. Oh man. <laughs> The last time I went over to Shia's place, he was he was sewing one of his socks to make sure that the, he had two socks to wear. Oh. All right, I'm gonna bring you guys some caviar for Christmas. <laughs> Enjoy, my friends. <laughs> McDonald's coupons here and there to get five dollars discount on. I mean, fries. we really do use. I sort of got like yeah. I'm like, do you have a coupon? Uh, Keon, like, nah, you have the last one. <laughs> This is a show about all things That's Iranian right. and right. all things yeah. wonderful. Right. And my ca- caviar guy. I what is his name? <laughs> you don't have to give his full name. His What's his name is Ali Reza. <laughs> Ali Reza. <laughs> My luck. He's got Reza yeah. in his name too. Ali for short, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Ali the caviar guy. <laughs> do you do you sometimes like if it's late at night and you're like you run out of your caviar? Do you have to like, you call him and yet yeah, yeah, where's my caviar? Yeah. And then Ali Reza has to like take a f- flight to get to you. And, uh, sorry, I guess you don't make the calls. You have a person make the call for you. Why would you pick up the phone? No, no, I deal with him directly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to screw up the caviar, oh man. My God. Deal with it directly. Wow. So good. Can so, yeah, you imagine? <laughs> I actually want to get, get. Give me his number. I, I will. Call him. I, I'm Maria, telling I you, try it's, this guy. it's the perfect date night. You just have some so, caviar, some champagne. Mu- it's like, great. Oh, how much? Is, like, this how is, how is Reza. <laughs> 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 you don't have to be the big dude here. Oh, we he know has, you can't afford the caviar guy. He has a girlfriend. Give me his number. <laughs> oh, maybe yeah. I can make a deal with the guy. And, uh, hey, yeah. he wants to so treat his caviar. girlfriend to some fine that's Caspian right, that's right. caviar. That's right. Yes. Wait, so let me ask. So it makes for a great night. Listen <laughs> to this. So what do you guys do? You like, honey, let's sit at home <laughs> yeah. and eat our caviar. Yeah, I mean, oh, some, listen, we don't like to go out all the time. Right. Some nights you just want to stand and have some champagne. Yeah. Yeah, Play exactly. I jazz. order pizza <laughs> <laughs> if it's on sale. <laughs> anyway, I highly recommend it. It's delicious. It's fabulous. It's Sweetheart, great. we'll be going to the Van Gogh Museum <laughs> <laughs> or having our caviar at home. I wish um, I did. Can we have the caviar in the McLaren? <laughs> uh, of course, my dear. Of course. Oh, my God. Tell you yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Kian docht, what can I do? Can you bring the caviar? Caviar to the McLaren, please. <laughs> of course, uh, I br- I peaked the caviar myself. I brought from Caspian Sea. Oh. Where does caviar come from? What is it? It's a it's sturgeon. It's, 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 so it's it's from a it's it's from a specific. Egg. Oh, that's right. It's fish. Yeah, yeah. yeah fish eggs. Not just fish eggs. It's a specific fish. It's a sturgeon. It's caviar and it's fish. only found in the in the Caspian. Do not Sea. diminish oh, caviar by how calling dare it you? fish <laughs> eggs, right? my friend. How dare she you? She has a person who does now this. Ca- <laughs> to, so Ali Reza is the dealer, right? Yeah. He doesn't, the, he doesn't go <laughs> he fish doesn't in the source it. Yeah, he has a guy. He has a guy. Uh, that it must be nice to have stuff. a guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you, you do you talk when you talk to your other friends? Do you guys compare like, hey, how's your caviar guy? My caviar guy. <laughs> it's like, and you guys are like I sitting mean, I, in a spa somewhere. And, <laughs> I have told all my friends, guys, I found the best caviar dude. <laughs> he sources the best quality, <laughs> best in the so town. Hard. But really, this is why I can't even invite Keon to my place, right? No. 
Because, like, I, I, I think I'm doing something nice. I put out some, like, peste or something. And then they go home and talk about, oh, he didn't have any ca- The caviar that he had wasn't the fresh kind. That Outrageous. Ali Reza gets us. I bring it from, I kill the fish myself. After they make the egg, I take it from Caspi and I bring to you in McLaren. Oh, I can I just imagine. Can I just highlight the fact that it's not accessible to get Persian Caspian Sea caviar? You, know? oh, you don't, you you don't go to a, right, that's why I'm <laughs> Saying that Shai, I found Shai, a would guy. you know which caviar is from Caspian Sea by tasting it? <laughs> Did you guys in Dang Show? Was that on your rider? Listen, here's what we need in our dressing room: a 12 pack of beer, towels, and some caspiar sourced from the Caspian Sea. Yes. Caspiar. Caspiar Sea. Caspiar. Uh, can you so, imagine yeah, that Keon's life? Eh? <laughs> this is like she, you know. What's up, Keon? You seem a little upset. My caviar guy has not responded. <laughs> I texted at least six minutes ago. <laughs> at least six minutes ago. Hello, what did you do? How I went to, I w- actually, here's a funny thing. I went to this, uh, for those of you who live in the Toronto area, in, in Canada, uh, the, the Iranian population has grown here massively in, mm. the, in the diaspora in general, but certainly in Toronto. And I've talked about this before, how I grew up you know, in the 80s, 90s, there were no Iranians here, now there's tons. And they tend to be north of the city. Somebody was telling me, uh, this, is, this is actually kind of jolly, somebody was saying to me that Iranians always go north. Yeah. You know that, like it's it's the idea to that the where, Caspian Sea? wherever they settle, Almost they go no, they go to the north. You know that, so like North Vancouver, yeah. North Los Angeles, yeah. and, you know. So North Toronto is where the. So now I don't go to a lot of these Persian restaurants and stuff that are north of the city in Rich Mill. So a friend of mine had said, "Why don't we go and see this?" We go. So we went to a place called Shishliks. Oh yes, you know I, this place. I, I have yeah. Now, uh, first of all, I feel bad. The guy, the owner, a lovely guy. And I was like, hey, this is a great place you got here. He's like, yeah, we, we've we been here since 2006, buddy. You know, like he's, it's like, I, you know, <laughs> I didn't know. It's been there, it's 15 years, it's been there. Now, this is more familiar to you guys, but, uh, but Iranian restaurants, they kind of have the seats set up in a circle mm-hmm. and there's a big space in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, and there's a giant carpet there, and mm-hmm. you know, a nice place. So it's, it was like a weekend night. So there's a band that plays, you know, oh. and singing the gugush stuff, and oh. and uh, yeah, it was a really, it was a really, I gotta say, nice night. She's this great place, but the funny thing is, I gotta say that Iranians, you know, see if you grow up in white culture, Shia, if you grow uh-huh. up in, uh, you know, in the in the West like uh, I did, you know. In terms of dancing at a bar or <laughs> let alone a restaurant, basically the way it works is, you know, people after midnight, after they've had a number of drinks, yeah. maybe we'll start, we'll get up and, you know, do a little <laughs> dance, even in a dance club, you know, <laughs> nobody is dancing before. I mean, this place, it was like 8.30 and the, the band started playing oh. and everybody was up and <laughs> dancing and throwing things around and, you know, doing oh. the, I mean, it was, it's amazing. And it's Did a, you get forced to dance? Uh, Gian uh, Bad uh, uh, yes. Gian <laughs> Bad Gian None of that? Well, f- uh, you know, well, I, we made the mistake. I got there around eight thirty or nine o'clock, so I'm trying to eat the kebab <laughs> while there's, you know, this whole party Wild going around. And everybody's trying to get me up to dance or whatever. No, it was, it was. I think there was a couple of birthday parties. It was. I mean, I I joke about it, but it, it it had that same vibe of like there's like a kid dancing and like a ninety year old person and like you know young people and yeah. like women in really tiny skirts and like <laughs> dudes who you know are you know have had a little too much kebab. Clearly, you know, and everybody is like you know uh, and, and it's fun but it's just so funny the the cultural standard for yeah. when the dancing begins is so different from yeah. the west you oh know? Yeah. yeah it's the same when you go to Mehmuni a, a few months ago we had a Rook Mehmuni That's do you right. remember yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know we had dinner and then it was like like a schedule and then it's like okay now we dance <laughs> it's like you yeah. get in a circle and start yeah, dancing yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it's tea time and you know uh, yeah, well, I, I'm learning that I mean well there's that was thank god we got to talk a little bit I mean these <laughs> yeah. Mehmunis that Reza goes to you go there I mean 
mean, you can't even. Uh, it's like from seven p.m. It's like extremely loud music, uh, and all that's left to do is to do dance and drink and do whatever the hell he gets go up to. Nuts, you know? like I'm telling you. And what's funny is that my cousins keep telling me they're like they don't like to go to white parties, like white parties, oh. like <laughs> white people parties, because there's nothing's happening. Like you just hang around and like yeah, because you have conversations with people. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'm you get to talk you. to people. <laughs> I mean, they, talking is not allowed in the, our culture. You no, know, no, you gotta just dance. You just blast the music so no one can talk. Come on, <laughs> come on, buddy. <laughs> That's actually what they say. They're like, ah, harf you're talking too much. Exactly, 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 like, yeah. why? Harf <laughs> remember that, we, Shai and I were, remember that party we were at last year and you and I were trying to have a conversation uh-huh. and that, that, that they were getting mad at us because we weren't going and dancing. And it was like, it's fucking 9 p.m. You know, the, 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 let the night happen a little bit. Let me have a couple of drinks and, yeah. Uh, anyway, I mean, uh, but thanks to Shishlik's very, very nice. Uh, so, how was the food? It's nice, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. They had this one thing where they bring out the whole, uh, the the one, the whole fish. You know, with his Ooh. head on it. Ooh. Yeah, stuffed fish. Yeah, nice. you kind of. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then. Uh, uh, there's a guy whose job it is to bring caviar from the Caspian Sea. Oh wait, no, that's Keon's <laughs> house, not a restaurant. They didn't ha- serve caviar. How dare yeah, they? Yeah. You wouldn't have liked I it. I will Keon. not They're be attending. It's too down market for you. <laughs> but, it's a lovely restaurant. Uh, yes, uh, but, but and you, Shia. Yes, what did you? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question actually. Poor Bernard Sarafour. <laughs> we are going to get to Bernard Sarafour. Please stick around. Yeah. She's a uh, you know. Uh, fabulous! I got. I really want to get into her story, but go ahead. Yes. Uh, what yeah. happened to Canadian national football oh. team, soccer team? Uh, are they qualified for World Cup? Or? Not qualified yet. Uh-huh. But uh, thank you for bringing that up too. This happened in the last week. Canada beat Mexico. Yeah, that was huge. Huge. I was shocked. Huge. Yeah. So Canada is actually the top of the the heap on the uh, Concacaf. That's a, wow. our our division, the sort of North America and, and Caribbean div- division to get into the World Cup. This means. Do you know what this? Guy, do you know what this means? You know. Now we were joking about the the hypothetical, yeah. almost impossible situation yeah. to to imagine that at World Cup time for Gion yeah. that there would be <laughs> England, Iran, and Canada. Yeah. You know who would I choose? Be- and I was like, well, that's never going to happen. So it actually could happen Can next year in it? Qatar in Qatar wow. in 2022. Canada looks pretty good to make yeah. it. England's going to be in. Iran is made uh, it already, almost yeah. basically yeah. in. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think that almost, Iran yeah. can't. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be very interesting. Thing. I mean, I don't know if the like what would happen if Iran would play Canada. I Imagine. have to decide. That would be decide right now. Cool. Which will it be? Well, I I always go for the underdog. Mm. I always go for the underdog. But which one would you go for right of now? My, of my lovable teams. Mm. So if, if Canada was playing England, for example, okay, I got to go with Canada because Canada's going to uh-huh. lose. <laughs> you know, and I, I know I'm going to get England to, in the later rounds. Yeah. Now, Iran is a little more difficult because definitely against Canada, Iran is, is the dominant one. Mm. Canada is the underdog. I think But, so, yeah. well, can, Iran is currently ranked 21 and Canada is ranked number 40. Is 40. Uh-huh. But if England were to meet Iran, Ooh. what do I do? Oh. Because I think I go Iran because Iran is the underdog there. Good England's answer. ranked number four in the world. So. Yeah, that's that's right. a good answer. Thank you. You would have gotten a lot of angry letters if you said the other way. <laughs> Which is what? That I, England over Iran? Yeah. You yeah, traitor. Yeah. How could you? Yeah, that's right. The imperialists. <laughs> Talking about wanting to go to Iran is missing it. Like, yeah, all, oh, this, oh, all, all this BS. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, yeah. it, like, you know, if I would love to see Canada go all the way, that's not going to happen. But, uh, but uh, I mean, Iran is looking really good these days. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we've covered a lot. Uh, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, the fabulous Keon. Uh, We'll see you on the other side. Let's get to our feature guest. My feature guest today is an Iranian-American designer and a member of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, Behnaz Sadafpour, was born in Iran. She moved to Europe and then to the USA as a teenager. She then studied at the much-celebrated Parsons School of Design in New York and launched her own collection in 2001. Behnaz has been a pioneer in designing eco-friendly products since 2008 as part of her collections and was honored by First Lady Michelle Obama at the White House as the winner of the 2013 National Design Award for Fashion. 
Since her brand's debut, she's worked with Target, Tiffany & Company, Lancome, Hewlett Packard, and Van Cleef & Arpels, etc., etc. Her works have been showcased at the FIT Museum in New York, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, as well as the Smithsonian's permanent collection in Washington, D.C. And in 2018, Behnaz launched Behnaz Fragrances, all single-note flower essences inspired by her Persian heritage, and she continues to pave the way as one of the designers to watch around the world, but right now, Behnaz Sarafpur joins me from New York City. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's very nice to have you on the program. I and mean, you, you seem so prolific. I mean, my sense is that you are constantly working on something. Would that be true? Pretty much. You know, I, I, I've I always loved working. You know, I, I did well in school, but um, I couldn't wait to get out of school and start working. <laughs> I started working when I was a teenager and um, and I really only stopped for about two years, a couple of years ago, when I was making a transition from designing ready to wear to fragrances to just sort of take some time and think about how to develop that. So you're you're all a type, a type personality. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what, what am I taking you away from today? What are we sacrificing to do this interview? You know, it's, it's, um, funny thing when you're a small business owner, which I have, you know, always been aside from my sort of corporate affiliations. And it's, um, you know, one day you're, you know, just busy dealing with inventory issues, which is really unglamorous. You know, another day you're at a photo shoot. It's a lot of ups and downs. You kind of wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> Sorry, when you're a celebrated globally recognized designer, we still call you a small business owner? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're, this, this is taught off. You haven't completely left Iran. I think you're being modest. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let me get some of the backstory. You grew up in Tehran. Uh, you're this kid in, in Iran in the 1970s. Was it, I mean, would it have been always clear that you're this creative person who would become this world famous designer? I, I was always creative. It was encouraged by my mother who had gone to art school and loved you know, all sorts of visual art. But um, I always imagined when I was younger, I imagined it would just be a hobby. I didn't really think that it would be a career. <laughs> and there, there wasn't the doctor and engineer pressure? Um, for the boys, it was, you know, for me as the only girl, it wasn't. I think that, of the, um, you know, they imagined, you know, I would follow in the family footsteps where, you know, mom, you know, you get married, have kids, um, you know, kind of become, you know, sort of your dominant role sort of as wife and mother, um, which is, you know, very traditional. There wasn't really any pressure on me, um, which was kind of nice because it allowed me to just sort of um, experience what I wanted and kind of have different opportunities open um, without, you know, that kind of career pressure, I guess you could say. Kind of from a weird, paradoxical benefit of patriarchal culture, which is that you're emancipated to do what you want because <laughs> nobody thinks you're important enough to be an engineer or a doctor. Um, well, no, I mean, it's weird, you know, like I don't really think of myself, you know, as a feminist, but um, it kind of, you know, as you grow up as a woman, certain things occur to you that, you know, in some ways it's sort of left up to you to kind of, pave a road for yourself it definitely is that you know sort of there's not there are different kind of expectations i think when you come from a more traditional society for the girls and the boys sometimes and it's not and i don't think it's unique to iran i think it happens all over the world sure were you were you, were you drawing things were you creating things sketching when you were uh, young yeah i always was you know it's i you know since my mother had been an artist if, you know, if I ever said as a child, you know, I'm bored, she'd say, go draw something, you know. And I, I remember when I was, I was in Iran, I went to this Iranian American school in Tehran, um, first grade. And there was some kind of art competition for the entire elementary school, which was you know, grade one through five. And I submitted something and I won, which was really odd because I was seven, but I won you know, for the whole school. And it just, um, it seemed like, oh, this is like a fun thing. It kind of, it's, I enjoy it and it comes, 
easily. <laughs> what 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 was it? What did you submit that won? I did a drawing of a lion. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't exactly a new dress line, but it was a... No, I think it was actually inspired by the Iranian flag at the time that had a lion in the center sure, of it. Sure, sure. So you know, an image I was familiar with. Uh, you know, it, Ben, I was listening to you talk and seeing you in social media, for example. I mean, you do seem so American, you know, Um which is not that remarkable. You spent most of your life in the United States, but mm-hmm. but you didn't come when you were a really little kid. I mean, you were a teenager, and first you went to Europe. How how quickly did you assimilate when you ended up in America? Um, you know, first of all, you know, unlike you know most Iranians who immigrate to the U.S., um, my family did not land in Los Angeles, you know, or New York. Even um, I grew up in the mainline suburbs of Philadelphia. And I think in the high school I went to, there was only one other Iranian kid. That's it. And the first year, I have to say, I hated it. I hated it so much. And I think every day I told my parents, I want to go back to Iran. <laughs> wow. Why and, did you um, hate it? Why did you? Um, <laughs> um, it's just, I didn't know anybody, mm. you know? And it's just. I left Iran basically with like a small suitcase of my clothes, you know, and I was a kid. Like I didn't have my toys, my books, my friends. I had a cat I left behind, <laughs> you know, right. it just, it was a completely new world. And I, 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 I went into a school where all the other kids had grow, grown up together since kindergarten pretty much and had gone through the school system. And I was the new kid. <laughs> You know, it's a funny thing when, um, I mean, in, in the case of this revolution that has displaced so many Iranians and, and had an impact on all of our families, um, you know, the adults get it, right? When they leave precipitated by this cataclysmic event in, in the country, mm-hmm. uh, they understand the political or economic or cultural context. Um, a kid, I guess a 12 or 13 year old, even even uh, as, as a tween or an early teen, um, you're just thinking, I, what, I don't get to be with my friends, I'm not in my familiar comfort zone. Um, mm-hmm. So even with the revolution happening back in Iran, y- you would have chosen to get back on a plane and go back, huh? Sure, I mean, that was, you know, we had, um, you know, I've been very fortunate in, in my family that we, could um, afford to travel a lot and my parents enjoy traveling and you know since I was little you know I'd spend you know all my vacations in Europe and in the US but Iran was home so I always imagined going back and in fact when the war broke out with Iraq we had been on vacation in Greece and um, it was supposed to be it was the end of the summer and it was supposed to be the beginning of the school year and we couldn't go back because they said it wasn't safe to fly. And we were living out of a hotel room in Athens <laughs> wow. for a very long time until we were able to get a flight back to Iran. And, and I remember, um, it's, it's funny because it's like um, when you're a kid who experiences being in the middle of a revolution or wartime, it really like stays with you, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, there's so much, such unusual memories. And um, I remember flying back from Greece when we reached over somewhere near the border of Iran and Turkey. Um, the pilot I remember came on and he said, you know, I just want to let you know this, don't be alarmed. But if you look at your outside your window, you'll see two Iranian Air Force military planes oh that are God. going to escort us to Tehran from here so that we don't get shot down. <laughs> wow. So, and I still um, like remember looking out my window and seeing that like it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the kind of thing you forget. So, so you guys went back to Iran and then you leave? Is yeah, that- so we went back. Um, you know, those were such crazy times because every like one year there's a revolution the year after that there's a war like you just you don't know what's happening from day to day and um my parents especially my father he he loved his country and he didn't want to leave so you know he sort of 
wanted to hang in there, you know, as long as possible and see if things sort of calm down and, you know, we can kind of continue with our lives there. So we stayed for a couple more years before leaving permanently. Um, Shari, are you hearing that, that note that, that is that a, is there a truck b- backing up or something? Are you hearing that, b- 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 that little beeping sound when Benna speaks? I am in New York city. So <laughs> yeah, that's it. All bets are off. That's right. Um, <laughs> So when you get to the United States, I mean, again, just getting back to you being seeming so American, <laughs> I mean, forgive me, but you know, you don't have the Persian accent and I know that's a, right? that's a pivotal moment. You're age 12, 13. <laughs> no, they say actually 12 is the age after which you, it's really difficult to lose your accent. So you were right on the bubble there. Um, but you know, you- it's, I, I, I was always kind of good at faking it because also uh, a lot of my mom's relatives um, lived in Germany. And so before we moved to the U.S., we lived in Germany for a year, and I learned to speak German. And and I spoke German with a flawless accent, so much so that people thought I was fluent. They thought, like, I'd grown up in Germany. So wow. I, I think I just kind of had an affinity for picking up languages and accents maybe now, now you know you growing up in philadelphia i know something about philly in the 80s and 90s um you know Rough i mean town. tough town yeah <laughs> tough town broad street bullies in the 70s is not a, and and it's definitely not really known as a fashion hub all just dis, no disrespect to philadelphia but how right. was how was fashion design on your mind and how does a an iranian girl growing up in philly end up at parsons in new york which is pretty much the apex of design schools around the world if i know um well i it's funny i actually when i was 18 years old um my best friend was this girl who um she basically looked like a human barbie doll and she was scouted by um, an agent from Ford Models in New York, who I guess for some reason happened to be in Philadelphia and spotted this girl on the street and um, asked her if she would, they wanted to sign a contract with her and they wanted her to come to New York for work. And, you know, we were both 18 years old and her parents did not feel comfortable about their 18 year old daughter moving to New York and, you know, possibly getting into all sorts of trouble. So she um, made up a story and went to her parents and said that she said, Behna's parents are letting her go to New York for the summer. <laughs> and so can I go with her too? <laughs> Which was news to me because I had no plans to go anywhere. And then she came to me and she said, my parents, you know, they think you're a very, you know, level-headed girl. And they said, well, if Behnaz's parents are letting her go, then I guess we can let you go too. (laughs) So she said, will you come to New York? And I said, well, you know, you're going to model, but I don't really have any reason to go to New York. And she said, I've done the research. I found out I can, we can sign up for summer school at Parsons. And so we can go to class during the day and then in between, I can run around and do modeling gigs. And so I thought, okay, you know, why not? Like, you know, we're best friends and we have fun and why not? We'll go to New York for the summer. So I went to my parents and I said, Ursula's parents are sending her to New York <laughs> for the summer. So can I go? <laughs> well, well executed, well executed. Yes. yes. And, um, and so both of our, our parents let us go. And we went to New York for the summer. I went to summer school at Parsons. And summer school was not, you know, the college, you know, as a full-time program is difficult to get into, but summer school is not hard to get into. And so we went and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, And at the end of the summer, I, you know, went to one of the advisors from the school and I said, you know, I really had fun here, but I'm going to be going to college in New York. I'm back in Philadelphia. Um, but, you know, if I could come back here for a weekend class or something like that, you know, I'd love to do that. And she looked at my report card and she said, but you got all A pluses. Hmm. So why aren't you going to, going to college here? And I said, you know, you know, obviously people apply to college months in advance. And I said, I haven't applied to college here. 
Um, so that's not even thought of that as a possibility. And she said, well, you have all A pluses. So if you'd like to come, we'd like to have you. <laughs> you know, I mean, as, as I intimated before, from what I understand, Parsons is the the mecca of design institutes. It's the uh, it's the Harvard, it's the Juilliard when it comes to design. Um, yes. If if you can do this, I, I'm sure you get asked these kind of questions all the time now, but by by students or something. But what what do you think you most learned at Parsons about the magic, about the special sauce of being a great designer? Uh, you know, they the school is somewhat gives you somewhat technical skills, but they really encourage you to sort of be a free thinker on your own. And I think that's what makes the difference kind of coupled with, you know, some technical skills, because, um, you know, it's funny, people always wonder sort of like, what is it like being a fashion designer? Because I think what people see mostly of fashion designers is, you know, you meet a lot of celebrities, you dress celebrities, you send people out on big red carpet moments, you go on red carpet moments, um, they think like that's, you know, kind of the biggest part of the job. Um, but there's so many different aspects to it. And um, the moment you become a designer, you kind of, in a weird way, you become like a director and producer of things. Mm -hmm. Like you stop actually doing things. And a big part of your job is nagging other people to do things and you kind of become this like conductor behind the scenes that's kind of has a goal in mind and you're just pushing a team of people to kind of get different parts of it done it's a lot of sort of like managing something towards a vision at the end that's an interesting answer to the to a question of what makes a great designer uh, although i asked it in a roundabout way i said what did you most learn from from uh from Parsons, so let me ask it in a more direct way. I mean, what what would you say is the greatest asset that you can bring that, for example, in your case, that has made you a successful designer? Um, you know, I feel like um, instinct matters a lot in things like that, in jobs like that. People think a lot of being a designer is having an opinion. Like you just say, oh, I like this, I don't like that. but in a weird way, nobody can tell you that. Like people sort of expect you to have some sort of a crystal ball about like what's the next big thing or is you have to also work so far ahead and you have to kind of imagine what will people want. Not today, you can see what people want today, you see what people are buying, but you have to imagine what will people want next year or even sort of if you can think a little further down the road than that. And it's a very, it's tricky because business likes consistency and it's such a weird job because it's a combination of art and commerce mm. um if 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 you if it's completely a business then you just make what you know is known as merch <laughs> right. you make basic clothing right. and there's a big difference between fashion and clothing fashion has an emotional component to it where you have to do something that kind of pushes people's buttons or inspires them or gets them excited. Right. Um, that's something entirely different than like, you know, you need some more socks or underwear or you need some, mm -hmm. you'll need a bunch of t-shirts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I spent many years being a musician, so I kind of, um, trying to think of everything through the eyes of a musician. So if I, if I think of you as a songwriter, a fashion designer as a songwriter, um, you're, you're looking for what the, what the audience is going to, what, what the next pop hit is. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as songwriters, sometimes you, you write songs that you know are not going to be a pop hit, but you want to do it anyway because you, you believe in the song and maybe it'll appeal to mm -hmm. a small uh, sliver of an audience out there. Have you had situations like, like that where, you, where you're designing something and you know this isn't necessarily going to be a hit, but you like it? Um. Two things. One, sometimes you have, you come up with an idea and like you feel it in your gut. Like you're so excited by this, you know other people are going to be excited by it too. And you just feel it. Like you know a good thing when you see it. Um, and then sometimes like something just evolves and you're not expecting it to be a big hit. Like 
in all of my career, I would say the most well-known piece of clothing that I ever designed, I did not expect it to be hmm. such a big deal. It ended up just snowballing and being photographed so much and like being worn by like six different celebrities, the same dress right, right. Um, and getting in like three different books, you know, where the pictures were published, getting into a couple of different museum exhibits. Like it's like the dress that never dies. I feel like someday, like on my tombstone, there's going to be <laughs> this dress. <laughs> which, which year <laughs> you know? was that? When, when, when did you create that dress? It was in 2003 and it, it just and I remember when I designed it, I was I had gone to visit some factories in Italy and I was very jet lagged and it was maybe like three, four o'clock in the morning and I couldn't sleep. And I was just sitting there in this hotel room and I didn't even have any paper. I remember grabbing a cocktail napkin from the mini bar <laughs> and sketching this dress. And then I shoved it in my bag when I came back to New York. And as I'm going through all the pieces that have to be made for the collection, I'm thinking, oh, let's make this one too. Wow. <laughs> it's a great story. I love the napkin drawing. I mean, it's all the ingredients yeah. of, a, of a beautiful story. Uh, that's fascinating. I, let me actually take a couple of steps back. You mentioned 2003. Let me go back to 2001 because that's when you introduce a line of women's apparel bearing your name for the first time. And... I'm thinking about you, and it, you know, it sounds simple enough, and especially in this era now where on Instagram everybody seems to have their own brand or what, it, it may have normalized a little bit, but even 20 years ago, it occurs to me that it's, it, it was kind of a, an audacious thing to do in a way. I mean, it's true that you graduated from Parsons and, you know, you, you got these great gigs, but to have the confidence to say, I'm creating things, I expect people will buy and wear them, and I'm going to call them by my name. Um, tell me about right. having the confidence to launch in 2001. Yeah, It's funny you should say that because I remember at that time, that was a time when Tom Ford had become very famous um, as a designer of Gucci. Um, and he was probably one of like the most, the biggest names in fashion that was not, you know, a traditional, what they call heritage brand. Um, and, you know, Tom's, you know, a generation older than I am, but, you know, he was still like considered, you know, like a hot new thing because I don't know, he wasn't like Christian Dior. He was, you know, he was a contemporary living, you know, young guy. And um, this buyer came to see my collection, my very first season in 2001. She looked at this piece. It was this beautiful cashmere tuxedo coat with satin lapels, you know, Italian tailoring, beautiful piece. And she said, how much is this? And I think, you know, at the time it was like $2,000, which, um, you know, was expensive. And today that would not be considered expensive in the world of designer fashion. But she said, nobody's ever heard of you. You're not Tom Ford, but you're charging Tom Ford prices. <laughs> I said, well, nobody's heard of me yet, but I think the quality of the work speaks for itself. And and that's really kind of what started getting attention of the people in retail and in media that I was, you know, kind of an upstart, but I was doing really good quality work. Um, but but also you're not Tom Ford in, in that you're not a, a, your name isn't... <laughs> You know, it's not as easy. Bad nos sat for for most white people doesn't roll off the tongue in the same way. Were you? Did you ever wonder about that? I mean, were you encouraged? I love it. I love that you stuck with your name. But were you ever encouraged to change your name or create some kind of simple <laughs> moniker for the sake of the brand? You know, um, I don't know if it was the best business decision, honestly, to keep my name. To be honest with you, um, because it is not an easy name. But my work was always so personal to me that um, I couldn't imagine calling it something else. And and I and it was um, suggested to me, you know, when I was in high school. You know, I remember a teacher saying to me, "Oh, can I just call you Beth or Sarah <laughs> or something that sounds like Beth, not Sarah?" For and I said, "No." <laughs> I said, if somebody, if someone wants to talk to me, they'll have to call me by my name. And that's the only name I respond to. 
<laughs> good for you, man. You must have good. I, I, your parents have done a did a good job with you. They, you, you, you had that that kind of confidence, and that's that's such a big part of your story. You know, I mean, your collections have been carried by the the top stores, the fashion houses in the world. I mean, if, if I know all of the names, then they must be big. By by 2005, you're only four years into your own label, and Tiffany and company are presenting your collection at the flagship Fifth Avenue store. Do you do you feel pressure when your works are carried in, in such places, or, or at that time at least, or is it all exhilarating? You know, I think... Um I was very aware of the incredible amount of support that I was getting from the industry. And um, although it's funny, I, I felt like I really wanted to do a good job. I really didn't want to let those people down that had been supportive of me because it's not, you know, as much as fashion seems to be about trends and trend setting and forward thinking, um, it's similar to a lot of other industries where in truth there are very few leaders and a lot of followers um, Hmm. within the industry. Um, And I have to say like someone like an Anna Wintour who's so famous at Vogue, um, the thing that is special about her and, and it meant so much to me to have her support since the time I started was she's someone who you can truly say she's not a follower she's a leader um in terms of how she looks at both business and art and she she makes up her mind to get behind something Mm -hmm. and she stands by it um where you have many other editor-in-chiefs of other magazines who don't want to take a risk you know um and they they wait for you i remember you know another i don't want to you know say who but (laughs) you know another really major major magazine um you know, competitor of Vogue's, um, I remember, you know, they called me and they said, you know, we want to do a story with you. We're going to do a story with you and like three other people. Um, and this is, you know, when I kind of early on when I started and I said, well, and, and what did, why and, and, me and three and, other people? And what did you, know? you say? And what did you say to Elle magazine? Oh, it wasn't Elle actually. <laughs> actually, you know, there was a situation with Elle, but in this particular <laughs> okay. incident, I tried, I'm not I tried, about. I tried. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yes. But, um, you know, Vogue, they, they saw my very first collection, which, you know, it was 12 pieces of clothing. That's all I'd made. And um, the next day, and this is now I'm really aging myself, there were still fax machines back then um, in 2001. And I remember sitting at, uh, you know, in my studio and a fax came in from Vogue magazine with like the Vogue letterhead. And it said, we would like to do an exclusive two and a half page story about you. Wow. Um, Where this other magazine was like, well, you know, kind of hemming and hawing and like, well, I mean, you're kind of unknown and, you know, maybe we can do a story of like you, but like you and three other people. And, and they were, you know, and like, well, like, who do you know? Like, who do you know in Hollywood? You know, I'm like, I just started. I don't know anyone at all, you know, where like, you know, where Vogue magazine would say, who do you like in Hollywood? We will get your address on them. We believe in you, you know. You've talked about, you've mentioned business and art a couple of times. And I'm thinking about your conductor analogy and thinking, you know, uh, you become the a successful designer. You have to also be a conductor, but but the conductor isn't necessarily running the theater and collecting the tickets and making sure the the advertising is done. I, I mean, it, it occurs to me that it, it's a bit of a curse that once you achieve success as a designer um, and, and have your own collections out there, that. I guess how much of your time can still be spent being creative and, and how much of your life is taken up being a business person? Um, sadly, too little of your life is spent being creative. Um, I wish more of it would be. Um, if you really want to sort of be creative and like enjoy being a designer, <laughs> um, you know, I would say just always 
work under the designer, don't be the designer. <laughs> Mm. You know, when I was an assistant to a designer or a design director under a head designer, um, those were the times when I got to sort of have the most fun creative work to do on a daily basis. And and is it is it like the the napkin in Italy? Is it that are you always scribbling things or does design become something of a, a prescriptive job like you have to sit at your fancy desk now and um, or, or is it really the, the romantic idea that you find a piece of paper and you have an idea and you 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 scribble it down you know you probably maybe will relate to this also having you know worked as a musician um you kind of never know when a good idea is going to come to you sometimes you just sit there and you just have to just sit there for a long time and think and think and think until something comes to you. Sometimes something really good comes to you when you're, it's not a convenient time. Um, but I read a book many years ago. Um, I can't remember who the author was, but she was talking about the idea of the muse and how in Greek mythology, they loved sort of using this concept of muse because it took a lot of pressure off of hmm. the artist. <laughs> Because if you had a good idea or a bad idea, you could credit the muse, but you could also blame the muse. Like if you had a bad idea, the muse brought you the bad idea. Or if you had no idea, the muse had abandoned you. Right, you know, it's right. not your fault right. that you didn't have a good idea. And, you know, and then, of course, you could also take some pressure off by saying, you know, the, the muse inspired you <laughs> or didn't. <laughs> Interesting. Um, unfortunately, um, in fashion, because of the business aspect of it, you have deadlines, and the deadlines are pretty hard deadlines. And like, if you are not ready for Fashion Week, you don't have a business. So um, you kind of have to just keep banging your head against the wall until you have enough um, viable ideas to put a collection together. <laughs> and in terms of you as a creative person, is there a, because now you've moved into different strata of fashion, is there a difference between designing clothing versus designing jewelry and designing perfumes or does it all ultimately basically come from the same creative well? There is something about the process that is the same. I think just in product design, um, it's very methodical. You know, you could have come up with a concept and there is this process that you have to go through regardless of what the product is of um, making prototypes editing the prototype lots of note taking going sort of back to the drawing board until you can kind of fine tune it to the final thing that is um, both kind of conceptually and visually pleasing but at the same time functional because you know again it's not a fine art it's, you know, a commercial product. So that process, I imagine, if you talk to somebody who's in the business of designing cars or someone who's in the business of designing fragrance or clothing or whatever, there's a part of it that the process is the same. The process of going from concept to prototypes to editing to right. final product. I want to ask you a question that it feels uh, naive. So forgive me in advance for this question, but... But whenever I'm researching somebody who's a, a, a fashion designer, especially, um, there's always, and if they're successful, in your case, you're very successful, there's always a list of famous people who've worn their uh, you know, designs. And look at all these people who uh, uh, wore the Bahnaz dress. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, that it looks, it's fabulous, but I wonder how important that really is, celebrity endorsements, to have major stars and models wearing your stuff. I mean, in your case, it's the, there's this huge Kate Blanchett and Claire Danes and Rachel McAdams, and, and I'm sure it's very nice for you, but um, mm. is it just lovely or is there's this like do you do you guys do like a, a celebration dance in the office when rachel mcadams wears a dress because this is gonna change the the, the orders uh, or the shipment or the demand somehow a lot of that um is just a part of the business and doesn't is not to be honest that meaningful to me on a personal level um it's great for the business but because so much of that is sort of negotiated by st stylists um, and not so much a relationship between 
the designer and the woman wearing it. Uh. They're kind of unique moments in my career where like it meant a, I was really touched and it meant a lot to me personally. There was a time when um, Angelina Jolie had worn one of my dresses on the cover of Vanity Fair. And I remember the next season, um, I had a meeting with some editors from the Van- from Vanity Fair. And I, and I said, listen, I just, first of all, I want to thank you so much. That was such a big honor for me, having my dress on the cover. And, um, and the fashion editor was very honest, actually. She said, actually, don't thank us because we were not trying to get your dress on the cover of Vanity Fair. We brought in a big selection of dresses from a lot of different designers, showed a full rack of dresses to Angelina, and she picked yours. And she said that was her favorite dress. And we suggested a lot of other dresses and she refused. And she said, this is the only one I'm wearing. I love this one. I like this better than all the other ones. Wow. So wow. Angelina is the one who got you on the cover of Vanity Fair. So thank you, Angelina. And then, you know, another one. Um, Wait, Blair. hang on, hang on. Did you get to, <laughs> well, you can't just say that. Did you talk to Angelina? Did you tell her that? No, or- I have never, never met Angelina. Wow. Um, but, um, I, if I ever do meet Angelina, I will, yes, th- still thank her personally for that moment because it meant a lot to me that she picked it herself and she, um, because, you know, it's, I, you know, going back to small business owner, um, magazines mostly, you know, want to present products by their big advertisers who spend lots of money, like, you know, a Ralph Lauren, a Prada, a Gucci, those brands that buy multiple pages, um, they, you know, generate ad revenues for the magazines that, you know, keep their business going. There's not a lot of motivation to put, you know, a dress by, you know, a small business that, mm. you know, is not, not giving them big advertising dollars on the cover of the magazine. So, you know, without Angelina kind of standing up and <laughs> championing my dress, it would not have happened. And Benos, is it is it a game changer when that happens? I mean, do you that the following week or month suddenly is the phone ringing off the hook and you've got? It, does it really change things if if Angelina Jolie is wearing that on the cover of Vanity Fair? Um, you know, it's not like a lot of people are running to buy that dress because you know they're not like that many people who can afford to buy a four thousand dollar dress the whole industry notices, you know, then they think of you as, oh, you know, she's someone who could, you know, get that kind of publicity, who can get that kind of attention. And then the industry takes you more seriously, which may lead to you down the road, I don't know, selling some sweaters or something like that, (laughs) you know, not necessarily the $4,000 dress, but, um, but people notice. I mean, speaking of the industry noticing you, um, tell me about winning the National Design Award in 2013 and, and meeting Michelle Obama. I mean, um, I, that must have seemed like some kind of career pinnacle at the time. What what was that experience like? Well, she's lovely. You know, I had actually met her before once, but I'd met her. I'd been introduced to her at a party a few years before, but then I spotted LL Cool J across the room. <laughs> Who I was a big fan and of you, when and I you was dumped, a teenager. And you, you dumped Michelle for LL Cool J? Yes, I did. I, I was like, very nice to meet you. Good luck to your husband. <laughs> Bye. Uh, I'm going to go say hello to LL Cool J. So, wow. So these so are some parties you get to attend. Wow. <laughs> so, and, you know, of course, next thing you know, you know, her husband becomes president. And I fully regretted, you know, running uh, at the party. So... Um, I hope she didn't remember that you had shunned her when you uh, were no, a- awarded fact, this. Uh, she was, very, gr- she was uh, very gracious, you know, um, at the White House. And she said, I just want you to know, I do not blame you. I also would have ran to meet Al <laughs> Cool J. So. Oh, she did remember it or you told her? Yeah. Oh, yes, wow. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, what did it mean to you, uh, this this kid, you know, who's come from Iran, growing up in Philadelphia, (laughs) who's suddenly at the White House winning this National Design Award. You know, I have to say when um, they called me actually from the Smithsonian, a few months before we actually had the ceremony at the White House, um, they just called me on the phone from the museum to just tell me that I 
um, was being given the award. And I just, I, I have to say, I hung up the phone and I just started crying, um, which I never have considering, you know, all the, the, you know, privileges that I've had and the support that I've had, um, you know, grants that I've won, other awards. Um, this is the only moment where someone told me that I was being honored with something. And it like I just started crying because um, it's sort of like back to you saying that I, you know, I came here as a teenager and, you know, the first year I'm like, I want to go back to Iran. Like, this hmm. is not my home. And this, you know, being told that I was going into the Smithsonian's permanent collection was, um, it was very moving, you know, for someone who's an immigrant. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's uh, also something for us mm -hmm. to, I, I feel really proud of you. I, if you forgive, forgive me for saying, I mean, I think I, people in our Thank community you. have to feel that way. Uh, let me ask you about identity. It was a, it was a year after that in 2014. You did an interview, um, and and you were asked if you do designs that are influenced by being Iranian, and you said no, I don't do that. And you spoke about being, you know, concerned about being pigeonholed. Or uh, mm -hmm. what, tell tell me about that concern. You know, I think honestly, people are always, um, I don't know if this is something kind of general in the world, in all businesses, or if it's something with the fashion business, but um, people sort of, they always want to put you in a box and say like, you're known for this and like, this is what you do. You know, it's like, I don't know, maybe as a musician, you make certain type of kind of music and you make a song and the song is a big hit and then they just, they're imagine the record label come back can you just make more songs like that sure, sure. you know <laughs> yeah. like that like different not that but like similar somehow you know and that that would not make me want to do the job um like i wanted i was you know selfishly very interested in sort of my own personal growth and experiencing things in life and having you know kind of learning kind of through the process of doing my work i even did a collection um that was inspired by saudi bedouins because that was something that i didn't know and that was new to me but i wouldn't do a collection that was inspired by iranian costumes because like, I already know that, <laughs> you know, right, right. that wasn't a growth opportunity for me. That wasn't, I kind of liked with my fashion design to kind of go on a journey of learning and learning something myself and then maybe also sharing that with other people. So so that makes your more recent uh, adventure with, um, uh, and mm -hmm. venture with Bernard's fragrances um, all the more interesting. These are mm -hmm. these are single, the all water-based single note flower essences inspired by your mm -hmm. Persian heritage. Tell us about first of all, what are the fragrances? I'm actually the uh, the only generation of my family to be born in Tehran. Prior to myself, parents, grandparents, as far back as many generations as anyone knows on on both sides of my family, everybody's from Shiraz. And Shiraz is famous for its orange blossoms and, and of course, rose, roses and rose water is famous throughout mm -hmm. Iran. That was something that to me was so unique, but also so timely right now because I was looking for a way of creating a product that was really meaningful in terms of sustainability and being eco-friendly. And it was something that to me, like had a very solid history, but it was very timely right now because mm -hmm. there's such a movement in clean beauty and people really looking to um, the quality of ingredients that they use in their personal care products. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that started, I think with food with people's interest in eating organic food and sort of being more mindful of what you're putting into your body. And that sort of carry, has carried now to beauty products. And I know that, you know, Iran is where um, this science of steam distillation 
of botanicals was invented. Um, and I don't think that that's something that people all over the world know, um, that it's something that is kind of unique to where we came from. And I had gone to Iran, I would say, gosh, about 15 years ago um, with my parents. And I had this great opportunity to travel around the country a little bit. Mm. And um, one of the stops that we made was this distillery where they were making um, what in Farsi it's called arak. Mm -hmm. um, it's like literally like the sweat of <laughs> the flowers. Yeah. And, um, and they had these enormous, enormous vats in this courtyard where they were making all sorts of steam distilled like mint and like different and roses and orange blossoms and things that they use in food and in in kind of herbal medicine hmm. and they were such beautiful amazing products and so when i had this idea to start the botanical fragrances and i wanted them to be water-based and organic um that was sort of my my starting point Go to um it. remembering that experience and wanting to sort of bring that here there's something technical I want to ask you, which is I read in a New York Times article about these fragrances that you wanted to find straight from the earth scents that would please in real time. You couldn't find any, so you, you decided to create your own. What what does that mean, please in real time? Well, you know, generally when people wear perfume, the experience is, you know, you spritz a little bit um, on your skin. Maybe usually people would do it on their wrist or their mm -hmm. neck or something like that, and then you kind of you rub it in and you wait a few minutes and the idea is that the fragrance kind of develops after it's been on your skin for a few minutes mm -hmm. um the difference with my fragrances is especially the and they're not all water-based there are three of them that are water-based and three that are alcohol-based but um with these fragrances you the moment you spritz it on your skin that is it is what it is one because of the fact that there's no alcohol involved so you're not waiting for that to evaporate because initially you smell the alcohol first uh -huh. and then that kind of evaporates and then then you get this the smell of the fragrance oils so part of it is there is no alcohol so you're not waiting for that mm. and also they are single notes so it's one flower you're not it doesn't evolve so much and change on your skin. It's sort of you from the get go when you spray it on. It is it's the experience that you get. It's like hmm. smelling, putting your nose into a flower. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've, been, I've been thinking about your fragrances and thinking about how we talk a lot about. You know, when we talk about Persian culture, for example, we talk a lot about the music, the dancing, the food. We talk a lot about Persian food on this show. Um, that always comes up because it's such an important part of who we are and and how we identify. We don't often talk about the importance of scent. I mean, we kind of know it, but um, when it comes to Persian culture, it occurs to me that it's actually very important to us and mm -hmm. that, you know, often smelling something a scent can can trigger a memory or a feeling in in such a profound way much more so than any other sense um can, it does can, and it really stays with you you know i even though i haven't been to iran in 15 years like i if you blindfolded me and you put me on a plane and landed me in iran i i would know the smell of the street <laughs> it's amazing you know it's amazing. and for us at home it's like the smell of saffron is, you know, it's yeah. dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So have have you heard from Persians or I mean, even your mom or something with these fragrances? Do they, does it have that impact mm -hmm. on people? Um, yes. And, you know, it's funny because it's kind of sweet. The, the one that is um, called pure neroli, which is the essence of orange blossoms, um, I'm happy to say is the most popular one that I make, mm. <laughs> the one that's inspired by Shiraz. It is such a great pleasure getting to talk to you. I have to thank you for doing this and, and thank you for the time and, and sharing your story. Where, where do you feel like you're, you're at on, on your journey? I mean, you've, you've accomplished so much. You do seem like 
a doer. You've said that, the A-type personality. <laughs> Where do you see yourself taking things? Um, you know, um, hopefully getting to continue to be creative and make other products and make things that are personal to me but also resonate with other people um, because I think that, you know, for a creative person who is in that sort of balance of art and commerce, that's what you do it for. You do it to like make a connection with other human beings. And that's sort of, that's what makes it rewarding more than anything. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. I hope to talk to you again and congratulations on all the success. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Behnaz Sarofpour, a celebrated Iranian-American fashion designer. We reached Behnaz in New York City today. Microphone's back on for Captain Reza Groovy Shy and the fabulous Keon. How about that bad noise, Reza June? I was just she was she's one of it's so interesting because she seems to be at the level of Tom Ford and 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 all these amazing designers, but uh, it's weird that I've never like we've never like heard like I've never heard of her like in yeah. mainstream as a as a just a mainstream like audience and mm. uh but she's very very well known in the industry and that's that's qu something quite to be some that's something to be proud of but what i loved about her was that she was adamant about not changing her mm. name she's yeah. like you call me by my name yeah. <laughs> i love that, that was really cool. i can tell she's really focused she you know she's a really it's no it's no secret it's no joke that this person's become as successful as she has you can hear that she's got she's thought about things and mm -hmm. organizationally practically um and i i love the place it's coming from what she does you know and 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 the way she i guess has learned to mix that art and commerce thing that you know business and 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 creativity and her story is kind of like it's it, it's like it unfolds like a movie. Do like you hear where her family was from? Most Shiraz, of Shiraz, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out represent. to Represent. Yeah. Shiraz. What happens represent. when somebody says that? You get all excited? I get very excited. Yeah, mm. I know. And it started from Firuz Nadiri when he was like, I'm like, you know what? I knew we were doing something right. <laughs> Almost our show. We've Almost had a lot of Shiraz guys. A lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the great uh, uh, former mayor of Beverly Jimmy, Hills, uh, Jimmy Del Shah. Jimmy Del Shah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I love what she's doing with Arak, actually. Arak Ijat. Because in, uh, Arak Ijat in Shiraz is really, you know, is a very big. Uh, it's a big thing, yeah. yeah. And for Jian, who may not know what we're talking about. I don't really. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the essence of flowers and other herbs that they um, they get, they liquefy it, and they use it to make sharbat or. But uh, well, I was confused when she said that because I thought arak is also like alcohol. Isn't it, it is. It, they also call mm. it alcohol. Yeah. Wh when so it's the same thing. Arak and arak. Wh when you do the same process with kishmish, mm. it turns to arak kishmish. Yeah. Like why are you saying kishmish instead of kashmir? Raisins. Oh, because it's about arak and alcohol. Yeah. And it's <laughs> dehydrating. It's better to be the dirty. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Kishmish. Yeah. Kishmish. I I feel nothing but proud her you know she's uh she's made a name for herself in the fashion world and she's competing against you know names like like you said Reza, yeah. tom ford and mm -hmm. and you know i i have even more respect for her um that she didn't change her name mm -hmm. you know like she said no like i'm she's proud to be iranian mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. her name is quite iranian mm -hmm. and she's standing with it and uh, her life unfolds like a movie really like yeah. she goes to new york with a friend of hers mm -hmm. and yeah, the, the yeah. lie they tell to their parents and then like one of the, the d biggest dresses that got put her on the vogue magazine i think it was right mm. she sketched it in italy like on a little napkin yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. so cool it's, it's like a movie yeah. unfold like every and every she's she's right about the uh, uh Arab, like the dehydrating of the flowers thing like mm -hmm. rose water yeah, that yeah. that ca comes from iran actually actually when i was doing my segment for it's all persian us i was gonna at some point maybe touch on uh, rose water and mm. rose like that like the you know mm -hmm. uh, the thing of like making it into a perfume yeah. and she was it's, it's sweet that she said that the the biggest seller of the mm -hmm. behnaz fragrances 
Yeah. The orange blossom, the, the blossom from, 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 yeah. from Shiraz. Yeah. Yeah. Bahar Narange, Bahar she Narange. made me want to go to Shiraz, actually, just yeah. her story and describing it. It's very it. lovely during it is like springtime. You know, I had a bad impression of Shiraz because Rez is from there. And then <laughs> that was his first now, impression. I, <laughs> He's the worst representation of Shiraz, the city of love, was, of poetry, I, 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 and then you have Rez. Like, no, <laughs> it's clearly a very complex city because <laughs> I only hear amazing things about it. I'm like, yeah. Rez is from there. <laughs> you know, I, I, if, I would assume that Shai would be from Shiraz. I know. I, his father I am is. actually. Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah my father. father is, she's from. He's from Shiraz. Yeah, you see, you hear about like uh, artistry <laughs> and creativity, <laughs> and that's like, hey, I'm from Shiraz. And you're, oh god. Are you yeah. sure, man? Captain Reza. <laughs> this hand that doesn't have salt. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, a big shout out to Farid Emeryun and York National Realty. York National Realty, based out of Aurora, Ontario, Canada. Not too far north of Toronto. The owner is a guy named Farid Emeryun. This is a boutique real estate brokerage company that provides top tier service from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid has also made it his mission to give back to the Iranian community and the diaspora and has supported a number of Persian community events and projects. And this episode of Rook is brought to you with some support from him and his team. A big thank you to Farid Emeryun and York National Realty, the team there for all they do. Before we go today, I can. I wanted to ask you, how is it going with your new unmarried Persian girls, UPG, as it's you call it, right? It's going great. You know, we're talking about things that were always considered zisht, quote unquote, in the culture, mm-hmm. like um, things that were taboo and not supposed to be spoken about. We're bringing them to light. Well, so the latest one is uh, talking about Persian men and infidelity. Yes, and it's so gotten what, a what, lot. What's the, what, what are people saying? <laughs> I mean, it's, I think a lot of Iranian men are taking it the wrong way. They're a little uh-huh. angry about it. But here's the reality. Like, you know, us people that grow up in the Iranian diaspora, me included, this has been our experience. This is what we're seeing um, happening. Like infidelity is a big thing in our community, unfortunately. Uh, And it's not like I'm not generalizing and saying everybody is this way. Like I'm pretty sure Reza and Shai are are not uh, well, not the cheating type. <laughs> At least well, I hope away, you're not. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, we're just uh, talking about our experience of growing up Iranian mm. and just what happens, what, what goes on in the culture. You um, can catch Keon and her co-hosts uh, at what, UPG. UPG dot official. official. That's right. UPG dot official or unmarried Persian girls on YouTube. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching for you, Keon, with your your new series. Thank you, the fabulous Keon. Uh, you you would never cheat, would you, Shaya? <laughs> Uh, I don't speak until my loyal. <laughs> Sorry, it means you're Good answer. Anything. Good <laughs> answer. <laughs> Unless the opportunity presents itself. <laughs> he doesn't want to. Uh, thank you, uh, Gravy Shia. And uh, thank you to Captain Reza. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook, for all our different programs, the contemporary history of Iran, past Rook episodes, and UPG, you can link to them from rookmedia.com where we put up uh, videos and funnies and a list of our guests and their appearances. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Talented Anahita, Super Patty Saw, producer Susan, Savvy Roham, Panta the Artist, the Fabulous Keon, Alay Merdad, Captain Reza and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you have not done so already on any of our platforms. It is free to subscribe, and you can support us by becoming a patron. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, Mizun Washi.